surprisingly, uh, some people on Facebook decried racism. I think what was more interesting was that there were some people who supported these landlords, saying, why shouldn't homeowners have the right to protect their property? Now, I want to give you some context to Singapore first. Race is a big deal in Singapore. It's almost like one of the aspirations or the values upon which the country was formed was for multiracial and multi-religious harmony and peace. The idea that regardless of race, language, or religion, anybody who works hard in Singapore can succeed. Now, in Hong Kong, where it's predominantly Chinese, um, I'm not sure you sense it that much, but in Singapore, there is a more diverse racial mix that we commonly refer to as CMIO, that means it stands for Chinese, Malays, Indians, and others. So, from a young age, we are being told about the dangers of stirring up racial and religious conflicts. In schools, we observe something called Racial Harmony Day every July, and this commemorates all the racial riots that were happening in pre-independent Singapore. And did you know that over 80% of the Singapore resident population uh, lives in public housing, and there are actually racial quotas right down to each block. This is to prevent racial enclaves from forming. So the big question is, after so many years of very conscientious social mingling, is Singapore still a racist society? What I have on my screen right now is one of the study activities we did for my More Than Just in the series. We asked our participants to independently rate the level of racism that they felt in Singapore and to justify why. So I thought it would be interesting if you can take a moment as well and think about it for yourself in context of Hong Kong or any other city that you're familiar with. Okay? So I'm going to share some findings from our more than just um, dinner discussions which would be in context of Singapore. But I'm guessing that some of these are actually quite universal. Uh, so in Singapore, and I am glad for it, that we, we generally feel that there is more harmony than there is racism. And that's because we don't see widespread in your face racism. We don't hear of violent, racially motivated crime. And also the authorities who kind of pretty hard in terms of anything. But what people do see and do experience is something like casual racism, jokes and insensitive comments that might seem funny to you. But it would, it would actually be quite hurtful for the person on the receiving end. So most of our participants actually gave a rating from about 3 to 6, depending on how much casual racism they've experienced in their lives. Now we had a few people as well who gave very damning ratings, something like 8 or 9. They say the very idea of CMIO is the exact opposite of the race line. And being the exact opposite of race blind means we're hyper aware of our race, which makes us a racist society. Now I think from this stunning exercise, we can see that it is a kaleidoscopic existence that we live in. There is one situation, a Singapore that we all grow up in, and people have different perspectives on it because of the different lenses and the mirrors and the different elements that get thrown in a specific line of vision. For some people, it's a very rosy outlook. For others, that's so. Now, why, why would that be the case? Uh, I want to introduce this concept of Chinese privilege to you. It's a notion that's been increasingly discussed in Singapore. The idea is similar to the, the idea of white privilege that some other societies discuss. That being the majority and dominant group enjoys certain social societal advantages and benefits that they may not actually perceive. And these could be things like job opportunities because they speak the majority language. Or it could be something less tangible, something like um, how you meet and greet people with strangers you speak because some of your culture, the dominant culture, uh, is more aligned with what is societal norms compared to a minority group. As you can imagine, this is a, diverse, a very divisive topic in Singapore as well. You have people who say, and this includes Chinese Singaporeans, by the way, people who say, yes, there is Chinese privilege in Singapore, and we need to raise the awareness of this, raise the level of sensitivity 
that, um, that the Chinese community have when they talk to minority groups. And then there are others in the no camp, who, and this includes non-Chinese Singaporeans, who say, no, there's no such thing as Chinese privilege because everybody has access to good education and good public housing and opportunities if you work hard for it. So don't propagate a self-victimizing culture. And then there are others who will say, let's not use terms like Chinese privilege because it's so loaded. And they have a point, actually. If we start looking at everything as a race-based problem, we, act, we do miss out certain important details, like maybe it's a social economic problem. Or maybe, maybe there are other factors that affect that we have totally waved off or decided not to see because we decided it's a Malay community problem or an Indian community problem or a Chinese community problem. And that's the problem with civic discourse sometimes. It gets very heady and very confusing and gets very exasperating because you don't know who is right or who is wrong or what is real or whether you're justified to think in a certain way or not. Now, in this day and age, we're becoming increasingly aware of how the inundation of both information and misinformation is guiding our perception and, and, help and affecting our decision making about politicians and things like this. It is good that we're looking for facts and truth to guide us. Having run more than just though, I've come to realize that what is real may not actually be what is unequivocally true and objective. Let's do a quick fact check. The idea of race, which is what I've been talking about since the start of this presentation. Race is not an unequivocally true and objective concept. There is very little biological basis for the idea that there are racial divides amongst the human race. And this is why an Indian boy and a Chinese girl can come together and have a baby. Because essentially, we are one human race. So what we think of as racial divides are actually social constructs, an amalgamation of anything that we want to discriminate people by. That could be language, that could be physical appearances, perceived shared history, norms, religion, or even nationality. Before I go on to the next slide, sorry. I do want to say, though, that in certain situations, we do see that race becomes real. And this is when it enters somebody's agenda or somebody's policy. Now, in Singapore, it could be like it enters a CMIO policy stance and it affects whether or not you can buy your choice property unit or whether, it, whether maybe you are not eligible to buy the one that overlooks the garden anymore, things like this. But in our darker days of history, race was real even though it's got very little biological basis. It was very real in Nazi Germany for the Ku Klux Klan in the era of colonialism. And how real was it? It was a matter of life and death for some people. One thing that I can count on being real though, and this is what I found out from my more than just dinner series, is that hurt is real. Whether or not we think it's warranted or logical for somebody to think uh, or to feel that hurt in a certain situation, it's very difficult to rationalize away hurt feelings and tell somebody, like, it doesn't make sense, you're hurt. Because if they're hurt, they are hurt. And acknowledging hurt is important because we acknowledge the fact that people ultimately go through different experiences in life and that indeed, some people have had the shorter end of the stick. People are looking for safe spaces to talk about these feelings and experiences and you can be sure that their choice medium is not Facebook. So in that regard, I'm glad that Lewis and I were able to come up with more than just, where some of our participants were able to share more freely, even though it could have sounded politically incorrect. But before we get too carried away with this idea of safe space, I do want to warn you as well that safe space is another emotionally laden term that people argue about. On the one hand, some people say marginalized groups need safe spaces so they can share about things openly without fear of reprisal. But then we have the other camp who will say safe spaces limit free speech so that you, know, you can't say those emotionally damaging things, which constitute an alternative viewpoint. So as 
far as Lewis and I were concerned, we just wanted a safe space, whatever that could mean, where people with different experiences and opinions, um, people with different ideas could just come together and talk about it respectfully without breaking out into a fight. That was about it. Well, to be sure, we tried to reach out to trolls and racists, for a lack of a better term. Lewis and I did, did that go through a lot of Facebook articles and comment sections. Um, and when we saw a mean spirit to comment, we would actually leave them a note to say like, hi, are you interested? You seem interested in this topic. Would you like to come join our more than just dinner conversations? Well, I think we didn't actually manage to get them into the group. Either that, or trolls show up very differently in person. Well, not to be deterred, because we still needed somebody in our room, in our discussions, to articulate some racist notions that we can further explore, we came up with this thing called Google the Racist. Uh, this basically uses, and I think you may be familiar with this concept, it uses the, um, Google's autocomplete search uh, suggestions. And we wanted, we wanted to use this to help us articulate some of the things that people could be thinking about, but not telling us in the room. It's a proxy, it's not exact science, but let's give it a try. So I did this. This is google.com.hk in Cognito mode. And I type in, why do Chinese? What do you mean auto search, like auto complete suggested? Does anybody want to suggest something? Why do Chinese? Anybody? No? Snicker, snicker. I hear a lot. No? Sorry? Like shopping, <laughs> that's a possibility. But at least through google.com.hk incognito mode, it seems like some people are searching for why do Chinese shout yell saying why do you like red, why do you burn paper, why do you spit, why do you eat everything, <laughs> why do you squat, why do you use chopstick, why do you eat moon cakes, and why do you have small eyes, and what is this Lantern Festival about? So you get the idea, right? Let's move on to the next one. Why do Indians? Once again, this is google.com.hk in Computer Road. Would anybody like to suggest what people could be searching about Indian people here? Safe space, guys? Anything? No? Sorry? Good at math and IT? <laughs> well, I mean, good guess. What I saw was actually why do Indians have a red dot? Uh, why do Indian guys hold hands? And why do they wear turbans? Did it concur with some of what you had in your head? So we did this exercise in a few languages actually, because in Singapore, several communities do use different languages apart from English. We figured people who interact with the world with a different language have exposure to different media and therefore they may have different ideas about certain things and different questions as well. So I tried this again, google.com.hk, incognito mode, and I typed in Chinese, why do Indians? Do you think it would be same or do you think it would be similar or different from what, what was in English? Different? Yeah? Does anybody want to suggest? I love this. I, I honestly don't really understand this. I tried asking a friend, but she hasn't explained it to me, so I'm waiting for an answer to after this. I, I don't get it, like uh, why somebody would be asking why Indian people are called something. Okay? But I think it was an interesting exercise for us to realize, like for us to just get into somebody's head and think, why is somebody asking these questions? So, to be sure, we are not trying to erase this shame. And we're not even trying to advocate for the end of racism. We're just really trying to enter somebody else's brain to know uh, what they're thinking and why they're asking questions that, if articulated badly, could be construed as being pretty racist. Our conclusion from this little exercise is that ignorance is real. And people do come from a position of ignorance when they say certain things that sound a bit racist. Thankfully for this Google exercise, a bit slanted, but still we get a sense that apart from the position of ignorance, they're also coming from a bit of, of from a point of a bit of curiosity, and that's a, and that's a good thing. So there are two realities we 
see from our more than just project. One is hurt. The other one is ignorance. And now if you don't mind me and can indulge me a little bit, I'd like to bring you through a comic I wrote between a duck and a chicken to explain why hurt and ignorance don't go very well together. So that's it. It's not funny when people call us quacks. And then now chicken will fail to acknowledge the hurt and may even come across as being a little dismissive when it says, it's just a humble joke, man. The duck will shut down the conversation and say, you don't get it, you never get it because you're a chicken. And at this point, the chicken will, for some reason, at this point, will just assert its right to say whatever it wants, even if it's moon. I can say whatever I want to eat. I'm a free range chicken. Unfortunately, this is, this is the kind of conversation I see a lot on all these like free to area point of view platforms, don't they? It's not very helpful, it's not very constructive because they say a lot of things to each other but nobody is actually trying to advance each other's understanding of the other side. Conversation is hard, especially when you're trying to get disagreeable people in the room together to talk about it. And if your purpose is really to try to broaden conversations, broaden perspectives and widen horizons, it is a lot of work. There is a lot of planning involved. There is curation involved. There is a lot of research and learning how to frame topics and break down information in digestible nuggets of wisdom so that people get it. A lot of thought and consideration went into the format for more than just because, and a lot of thought and consideration has to go in if you're trying to do things like this because people need to feel a bit safer in their sharing and their learning. And I'm sure it was not just for more than just, but even for today's TEDx lineup, it was the same thing. So you can be sure that more than just was really more than just about race and racism. And it will be more than just about sex and sexism, or age and ageism. More than just was about a process in which different people can talk and negotiate ever-changing boundaries in a pluralistic society. It is about being able to engage with somebody unlike yourself. Now prior to today, Somebody had suggested to me that it was a bit incongruous that I, a Singaporean, would come speak to a Hong Kong audience about civic discourse. To that, and I thought as a befitting end to my, to my presentation, I think it might be nice for us to all go back and have a think. What kind of labels do we place not just on other people, but also on ourselves? And what notions of civic discourse do we have that may not actually be true? And last but not least, will you be able to let me, this Singaporean, be more than just those labels? Thank you very much.